Hi, I'm Lisa Buxbaum, CEO and founder of Soaring Words. Soaring Words' mission is to inspire millions of ill children and families to never give up. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Duckworth, who is a paragon of positive psychology and the author of Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance to Achieve Really Hard Goals. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on your book. It's amazing. Thank you. There it is. Talk about grit. Yeah. And wanted to see if you could explain what grit is and how that would be relevant for hospitalized kids and families that are grappling with difficult situations. The way I define grit is as a combination of passion and perseverance for really challenging long-term goals. Sometimes when people hear the word grit, they think of failure or that kind of feeling. Can you explain how this really has nothing to do with that? Well, I think overcoming failure, or let's more generally say setbacks, right? Because failure, we usually attribute the cost to ourselves, but, but there could be adversity that it's not our fault, but it happens to us, and that's, that's still an obstacle to overcome. I think that is part of grit, actually, but it's not all of grit. And, and the reason is because if you're resilient in the face of failure or setbacks, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be passionate about something. I mean, to be gritty is to really care about something so deeply, so enduringly, that it gives meaning to all of your effort. So, so yes, resilience and, and hard work are part of grit, but the way I define grit, they're not all of grit. How does a young person get to be more gritty? I ask myself this question, Lisa, as a scientist, but um, also as a former teacher. I used to teach kids in middle school and high school, and um, as a parent, right? My my kids are 13 and 14, and I I know you know parenting is something you take seriously as well. So every parent asks themselves, you know, how do I how do I cultivate character in my kids, grit or other things that I might care about? You know, I think one thing that parents can do is they can model these qualities that they hope their kids will develop. You know, kids are always watching us right. and they imitate us. And um, I think if we can understand that it's not only what we say, but what we do, then that actually helps us enormously. So for me as a parent, I try to model being gritty about my work. Um, and I think it's not a miracle. It's not that my kids will then spontaneously be just, you know, exactly the way I think they should be, but it's helpful. Second thing I'll say is that Parents who are effective parents are both supportive, but also demanding. And it's not an easy combination to pull off, but it is possible to communicate to your kids that you know you love them unconditionally. There's nothing you wouldn't do for them in the world. And there's nothing that they could do that would make you stop loving them. And at the same time, by there's the rules. <laughs> there's rules, exactly, exactly. At the same time, there's rules, you know, they're, they're non-negotiables, and there's a, you know, kind of a, no, I'm disappointed in you occasionally when, when you are, or, you know, I know you can do better. And I think this combination of being supportive but also demanding makes your kids not just imitate you, but also emulate you. Right. You talk about in the book the really hard thing rule that you and your husband model to your two daughters. Can you tell us what that really hard thing rule is? When my kids were about kindergarten age, so they're, they're one grade apart, I think I was just finishing up my PhD and I had to ask myself the question, okay, you know, as my kids are, they're not babies anymore, right? You know, how am I going to encourage grit in them? My husband and I came up with what we call the hard thing rule. It has three parts. The first part is that everybody in the Duckworth family has to do a hard thing. And even at that age, my kids knew what I meant. That means it's something that takes practice, where you're really trying to improve. You're getting feedback on what you've done right. You're getting feedback on things that you could do better. And you're trying you know, over and over again. Um, that aspect of the hard thing rule is something that I think is a really important lesson for kids to learn generally. It doesn't matter to me that you do it through piano or that you do it through ballet, but that you do it through something. The second part of the hard thing rule is that you can't give up until it is a natural ending point, until you've fulfilled a commitment. So you can't give up on track in the middle of track season, which one of my daughters asked if she could do. And you, you can't quit ballet class before the tuition payment is up. I mean, you can't, you can't quit in the middle of things. Um, 
So the third part of the hard thing rule, I think, gives back autonomy. I and mean, you talked about limits. Well, those are two kinds of limits. Like, you have to have a hard thing, and you can't quit until the natural ending point. But the third part gives them back the autonomy. No, nobody in our family has had their hard thing imposed upon them. So I chose... There was choice. There was choice. And I, you know, as, as, as someone who's as deeply interested in psychology as I am, I think we both recognize that choice is truly fundamental to being intrinsically motivated in something. So you, you mentioned choice, and that's really important because each day a hospitalized child or his or her parents make hundreds of choices that really has a positive cascading impact on their physical and their emotional well-being. And can you talk a little bit about positive mindset? Yeah, you know, I think there's um, a lot to be said for how complicated the world is. And many people have pointed out to me, oh, here are all the things, Dr. Dunworth, that you can't control. You know, you can't control that a disease happened to you. You know, you can't control necessarily what's going to happen after the diagnosis. There's so many things that are out of your control. Well, one thing that's true about gritty people, and people who generally, I think, are adaptive and, and thriving in life, is that while they acknowledge that there are many things beyond their control, they choose to focus on what they can control. And by that I mean, for example, if you are a parent with a sick child, it's true that there are many things that you can do nothing about, but you can ask yourself every day, what can I do you know, towards whatever end you're trying to, you know, to get your kid better care or to make them, you know, uh, you know. Exactly. So you're right. talking about in the book this concept of deliberate practice, which we'll get to in a minute. One of the things you said, which I really loved, and I think it's important in the context of illness, is that parents have to let their children know that they're really, really loved and that they should be very demanding. And I think it's easy for parents when their children are in the hospital or for kids when you're in the hospital to be a little whiny or like, I don't want to do that or to, to baby them. And that doesn't really help the, the child and it doesn't help the parents because when they walk two more steps in physical therapy, it means that they're getting stronger. And that also ties into the positive mindset that instead of focusing on that they still can't walk or play sports, they walked two more steps today in physical therapy than they did yesterday. And it wasn't easy, it was actually very difficult. So all those things kind of coming together. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's it's a it's it's certainly love when you support your children and you tell them that you respect them and that there's nothing you wouldn't do for them. But it's it's equally love when you tell them, you know, I need you to get up again. I mean, you know, I'm going to push you a little bit. If you know, if you didn't love your kid, you wouldn't do that because that's hard, right? And so the challenge, I think, is to know how much to push, right? So, so you can push too hard, right? I mean, you can ask them to do things that are just impossible for them to do. I think the idea is to take them from wherever is extremely comfortable for them and nudge them a bit into that range of, of you know, productive discomfort, but not so far that you're really expecting them, I mean, that there's nothing they can do but fail. That's not productive for anybody. No, no, and that really creates a cycle of negativity and self-blame and just feelings of that it's impossible. Which brings me to my next question, which is talking about this notion of growth mindset. When I was a little girl, my favorite book was The Little Engine That Could. <laughs> yeah. I think I can, I think I can. And I've seen in my research that with Soaring Words Kids that when they believe that they can do something, working towards that goal makes it more possible. Yeah, you know, there's so many quotes on this, but they're all true. So Henry Ford uh, is often quoted as saying, whether you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. And, and you know, that gets to this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. certainly on the I can't part, right? If you think you can, at least you have a chance, right. right? But you know, we've seen this over and over again with kids who are in the hospital or out of the hospital, right? I mean, for grown-ups too, it's almost universal, where people kind of count themselves out mm -hmm. and they make that come true. They're sort of like, see, you know, things didn't work out for me, but it's partly because they made that, that happen. I think to have a growth mindset is to really focus again on what you can change and to hold on to a bit of hope, right, that, that there's something, you know, maybe not everything, maybe not most things, there's, there's something um, that you could do to make your situation different. If you talk to Carol Dweck about where her research really comes from, you know, she was going through college when some of the earliest experiments were being done by Marty Seligman and Steve Mayer trying to figure out 
the signs of hope and the signs of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And she knew about these studies, but she was asking the question, well, where does hope come from? I mean, it's true that we can now understand it a little better, that to lose hope means to lose a sense of control. And that was the seminal finding. It's kind of obvious to us now in 2016, but 50 years ago, it wasn't obvious. Carol wanted to know, where does, where does this bias come from to, to sort of tilt towards what I can't change or tilt towards what I can? And I think her profound insight is that we're all walking around the world with these little private theories in our head. And, you know, the sort of the way it is, you know, the way the world works and the way human nature works. And for somebody with what Carol would call growth mindset, your theory is that intelligence and ability itself is malleable. Like, people at their core are changeable. Right. Uh, and if you have a, a fixed mindset, it's the opposite belief, which is that you believe deep down that you are who you are. You know, I'll never be good at basketball, or, you know, I'm just not a math person. Um, I'm an introvert, and there's nothing, you know, that would ever change that. And I think that science is on Carol's side. So not only is a growth mindset more adaptive in the sense that things generally work out better for you right. when you keep trying, but it's also true from a neuroscience point of view that in fact the brain is plastic and it's plastic all throughout life. Which is why it's so important that when someone gets flattened by an illness or a diagnosis, they see that there's a lot of room in there to work hard, to have the delivered practice, to have that positive mindset, that that has a positive cascading impact on their physical and their emotional well-being. And I don't think either of us are here to say that you know you can cure anything with yeah. a positive. That's not what we're. That's not the message. Uh, and I know you well enough to know that we agree entirely on that. I I think that you know you're exactly right that you know if you approach things with well, what can I do, you know, what could I do with this day to make it as good of a day as I can make it? I mean, that's, that's all it really is. And I think that kind of light switch of deciding that you're going to do that versus kind of capitulating to, you know, this um, more passive, like you're just kind of being tossed around on the sea of circumstance, I think it really dramatically does. It's like you said, it's a cascade. And the other thing I'll say, and it's not just about kids, but grown-ups like me um, and like you, um, well, I'll be interested to know if you agree, but I think a lot of this uh, comes from the people who love us. You know, it's not just a resource that we have inside. You know, grit depends on other people. And for myself, I, I lean heavily on my husband. Um, poor, poor guy. Uh, when I wrote that book, I, I whined, I cried, I blamed uh, pretty much everything <laughs> on him, and it sounds uh, like the book I'm writing now. <laughs> yeah, right. So don't feel so bad. The book that refuses to get finished. Yeah, right. It's like all your fault. Um, and you know, we meet those people who love us and say, you know what, today's a bad day. You know, You'll let's finish the chapter like, tomorrow. Let's get up tomorrow. Right. But yeah, right. And let's keep going. When I think about your work, Angela, I think about one of our favorite soaring words activities: the best future self exercise or a patient, or his or her brother, or sister, or parents, even the healthcare professionals that are doing the heavy lifting and caring for these kids and families, they imagine themselves in three or six months or six years, and they think about the best things that could have happened or the best feelings they could feel. And then they create this image. They write about it. They draw a picture about it. And then that gives them a guidepost, something to look forward to. And when they're doing these difficult goals with deliberate practice and physical therapy, occupational therapy, relearning what the new normal is, they have this image to look forward to. Can you talk about the whole concept of best future self? I think it's really important to actually have a goal in mind. You know, when I work with kids, I often call it a wish, right? But a wish and a goal are, are the same thing, really. It's like what you want to come to pass, right? And I think articulating that and, and really uh, imaging it, you know, like making it come alive in your mind with all the details, I think it's a really, really important way that human beings tend to move forward, right? I mean, kind of without that, like you said, you're sort of, you're sort of directionless, right? But it's like, oh, this is what I'm aiming for. I do it myself, you know, and sometimes I forget to do it and, you know, wiser people than me remind, like, well, what are, like, what does this look like? Just you know, relax and imagine for a moment, six months from now, if everything goes right, you know, paint that picture, and then you realize, you're like, 
gosh, that's what I'm going for. I would make a suggestion about the best future self idea, and it comes from some research on goal setting mm -hmm. and planning. I think it sounds like you're, you're doing this, but I'll just say that one thing that's really important is that you take that wish, right? And you say, and how will I feel? And you, you, know, you imagine it in technicolor. And then you try to bridge it to the present, right? So you try to come back from that and say, well, how do I get from there to here? Or how do I get from here to there? And what's my plan? And then it gets very concrete. Then it's, you know, when and where am I gonna do what? in order to achieve that future. This is work that was done right here in New York City by NYU professors Peter Goldwitzer and Gabriel Ettingen. And they found that if you merely fantasize about the future, you feel good, but you don't do anything. You know, kids going to physical therapy who are able to bridge the positive future right. with this, okay, yeah, tomorrow at seven o'clock, exactly. Right. Here are the milestones, here's what I'm gonna do, here's when I'm gonna do it, here's where I'm gonna do it. Then you not only have this positive fantasy, but you have motivation to actually take action. That's great, really important, helpful. <laughs> Angela, what advice do you have for parents of seriously ill children to help the parents be more gritty? You know, one thing that I've learned about grit is that it's, it's not only a self-oriented motivation at all, right? That it's, it is other-centered. There's nothing more other-centered than a parent. But one thing I think that can keep us going is to recognize that if you want both engines of, of passion going, it's, it's both the other-centered and the self. You know, you have to nourish yourself. And so I'll just, uh, you know, somebody who I consider to be a great friend of, of positive psychology and, and the kind of work that you do is Adam Grant yes. at Wharton. And Adam would say that, you know, to really sustain giving behavior, you can't only be other-centered, you can't only be self-centered for sure. It's magical when, when you're both. So for parents who are feeling exhausted and burnt out, if they know for sure they've gotten the other-centered part checked off, not only on a daily basis, hourly, because, you know, kind of the care that they have to do, they might ask the question, well, how do I nourish myself? Because really, to be a sustained giver, I have to sleep, you know, I have to get some exercise, you know, don't feel guilty about getting an iced coffee, you know, um, don't feel guilty about spending some time with friends. So for me, one of the things that's really important about grit is that there's typically an other-centered purpose and a kind of self-centered interest in a way. And it's, it's both of those engines when they're both going is when people are most sustainably motivated. Right, so that there's not resentment also and that there's- And there's not burnout. Right. Yeah. Exactly, compassion yeah. fatigue is a big thing. I mean, seen. you're talking about a really interesting example, which is, you know, parents caring for their sick children, that's kind of, you know, the ultimate alter, I mean, everything is about another person. A lot of the people that I've studied are not in that situation. They're trying to win the Olympic gold medal. They're, you know, trying to have a tech startup that's, you know, fabulously successful. In a way, for that audience, the question is how do you turn on the other-centered purpose engine? Because they already have the self Mm -hmm. uh, you know, self-oriented interest. So, but it's the opposite with, with parents. I think oftentimes, you know, they already have the other-centered purpose engine turned on to 10 out of 10. Right. It's like, how do we now, how do I now take care of myself? Like, what could I do during my day that's not just useful for this other person that I love, but, but is interesting to me and that is fulfilling to me as a person. And this other-centeredness, this connection with other people, is why from the beginning of Soaring Words, we baked in this pay it forward, where every patient is invited to make something, an art project, a haiku, a fable, a photo, to pay it forward and give to a stranger or give to another child in the hospital or their nurse or child-like professional. And it's that doing something for someone else that really reminds you that you're creative, you're funny, you're compassionate, and that you're not just a patient attached to an IV pole. I love that about Soaring Words. So in our experimental work, we have experiments where we ask people to receive help or to give help. And typically, when you want to help someone, you just give them stuff, right? Here's advice, you know, here's money. Here. But, but really, I think it's dramatically more nourishing when people help 
another person. So there's a real magic in pay it forward. You know, everybody can be useful. You know, even if you're in the hospital and a lot of people do have to take care of things for you, like what can you do to, to be truly, um, you know, beneficial to someone else? I think there's a deep human instinct to be needed. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we should allow people of all ages and whatever, because there's really nobody on the planet who couldn't do something for someone else. I, I, I think that's like, you know, the best thing really that you could possibly do for someone, which is enable them to help someone else. And then that taps into feelings of gratitude, purpose, meaning, joy. And in our work, it actually makes people grittier. I mean, actually, you know, we have this kind of like grit mentor uh, study, and, and when you ask someone to help someone else be gritty and persevere, they themselves end up being grittier. So I think the pay it forward thing is, is so terrific. You know, unlike so many things in life where it's like, oh, well, you know, it'll make you fat or it's bad for the environment. You know, pay it forward just makes everybody better. There's no downside. There is no downside. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Angela. It's been a pleasure sharing your wisdom and your warmth with us for all the kids and families at Soaring Words. And uh, just best of luck with the book. It's already a bestseller, and it's <laughs> always you. great to spend time with you. And for everyone watching, please go to soaringwords.org, check out the Best Future Self exercise, and learn how you can become grittier. And send us an email. Soaring Words is the power to heal.